You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is Episode 64, covering the week of March 20th through March 24th, 2017. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. A couple of housekeeping things. Again, if you like this podcast, please share it around social media. Please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and like our YouTube page. Also, you can get membership information at our homepage, www.abbevilleinstitute.org. You can find all of our membership levels there. You can be a monthly member for as little as $3 a month if you're a student, or you can get an annual membership uh, for as little as $25 a month if you're a student, or if you're not a student, uh, $5 a month or $50 a year. So head on over there and check that out. We also have some uh, levels of giving for those who have a business, if you want a business uh, membership, or endowment uh, options, if you would like to leave us some stock options or other things. We can do that too. So if you like what we're doing, if you like this podcast, if you like our website and our conferences, which I'll talk about in a second, you could help us out by giving us a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute. Also, our summer school is coming up in July, July 9th through 14th, 2017. Uh, it be a great time for you to show up. Uh, slots are filling up very quickly. We only have a few left, so if you're listening to this podcast and you're thinking about heading over to our summer school, which is in Seabrook Island, South Carolina, uh, you might want to do that uh, soon because we may not have many slots left. So uh, head on over to our website. It's on the main page, our 15th annual summer school. And the topic is generally being a Southerner in an age when being a Southerner seems to be uh, faux pas, right? It's, it's, you're a persona non grata if you are a Southerner today in the era of political correctness. So how do we do that? How do we, con- how do we confront that issue? And uh, how do we show our pride in being Southern when everyone seems to think that's a terrible thing to be outside of the South? So uh, even some Southerners. And actually that particular topic... Uh, is relevant for this week of material as well. So uh, think about our summer school. We probably will have another conference in the fall. Uh, we just have not uh, developed that yet, but um, probably something like that will be going on too. Okay, let's talk about this week. We had a lot of cool material this week, and so um, and a general theme uh, that um, goes along with our summer school theme. Uh, so I'll talk about that in a second. But the uh, the first article of the week um, really set the stage, I think, for understanding the Southern political tradition. And it's a review of Kevin Goodsman's new book, uh, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary, A Radical Struggle to Remake America. And uh, that just came out uh, in January this past year, 2017. So I reviewed this book uh, for a different website, uh, but um, John Devaney, who always does a great job, reviewed this book for our website, for Abbeville Institute. And so he brings up the main points of the book, and I think the the dominant theme of the book, and actually uh, Dr. Goodsman has said this is what he wants everyone to get out of it when I've talked to him, but that's federalism. And what we need to do to understand Thomas Jefferson is not, he gets into some issues here about uh, Jefferson's views on race and Indians and uh, that type of thing, but uh, also on education and freedom of religion. But all of those particular ideas are confined to his belief in federalism. Jefferson, as we've talked about in this podcast several times, was interested in reform only in Virginia. You know, his vision was eye level with his mountains. It didn't go beyond Virginia. And so when he discussed things like uh, freedom of conscience, uh, he was only interested in that in Virginia. Uh, He wasn't trying to reform the entire United States. He wasn't some crusader out there like the New England Yankees who was trying to make everyone in their image, remake everyone in their image. This wasn't a shining city upon a hill, as uh, as New England often said. This was reform in Virginia. And in Virginia, Jefferson was considered to be uh, a radical. Um, His views on education, for example, uh, his ideas on compulsory Uh, public schooling, or at least free public schooling, a little different than uh, what the Prussians wanted. Uh, Jefferson wanted everyone in Virginia to have access to school, primary schools, and of course you would pick the best, the cream of the crop, and they would have access to uh, secondary schools. But at least everyone in Virginia would get a rudimentary education. They would all learn how to read and write and do arithmetic, which was not always the case. So 
Jefferson's vision of education was quite different from that of our modern system where we think everyone uh, should get uh, an education and if they can't even if they can't do it they should go on to go to college uh, Jefferson didn't believe that I mean he he was someone who believed in a quote-unquote natural aristocracy and so you wanted to ensure that the best and the brightest of your society could have access to education but it stopped after primary school if the kids the students were not able to go on from there you wanted your best moving on and he wanted those best to have access to uh, the best education they could get and so if you look at his uh, institution University of Virginia it was uh, revolutionary for its time um, it was uh, the the best school in the South for a long period of time. He wanted it to be uh, something that would uh, keep Southerners away from the dark Federalist mills of the North, as he called them, and allow uh, students to have a, a real Southern classical uh, education. And so it was a valuable contribution to a Southern society, and still is today, uh, if you can keep the carpetbaggers out of it, which is what uh, the third piece of the week, uh, some of that talks about. So uh, it's it's important to understand Jefferson's position. Now, in federalism, you know this this saturated everything he did. Uh, this idea that the states had complete control of most of the issues of the day, that the general government had expressly delegated powers, and those powers were not to be expanded uh, beyond what was written in the Constitution. And that is the point of a, of a written constitution anyways. The idea of a written constitution is to confine the powers of the general government to those that are expressly written down. When, when a power is granted, uh, that power then can be rescinded. And at this point, who was doing the granting of the powers? Well, the people of the states, the states being important. Uh, this was a federal republic, not a national republic or a consolidated republic. Uh, we had states that had primary control over most issues that confronted the people of the states. And so I, I often bring this up to my students. You know, if I am going to say uh, you, have, uh, you have the ability to grade your quizzes yourself, I hand out a quiz and I say, you know, I don't really want to grade this, you grade it. And then they all come back 100s. I can say, well, I rescind that, that granting of that power, that delegation of power, because I had the authority to do it. And uh, when you look at a granted power, that's the case. You're not giving up sovereignty. You're simply saying, I grant you the authority to do this. But at the end of the day, if you abuse that authority, I can take that back. I can rescind that grant. I can resume those powers myself. And that's the whole key to federalism in the American Union. If you look at Article 1, Section 1, it talks about granted legislative powers. Well, who was doing the granting? Again, the people of the states. And so Jefferson and the Jeffersonians viewed the powers of the general government in that way. Uh, they thought that those powers could be rescinded at any time, that the states had the authority to check the central government if it was abusing its authority. And Jefferson viewed a lot of reform uh, and a lot of issues with, through that lens. Uh, he was many things, but more importantly, most importantly, he was committed to federalism. And I think if we look at Jefferson in that light, uh, we can see him as, as we've talked about at the Abbeville Institute, many, in many ways, the intellectual progenitor of our political positions. Uh, this is why Jefferson, to, to us at the Institute, is in so many ways uh, the ideal Southerner when it comes to uh, that particular position. You can talk about Jefferson the man in other ways. Uh, you know, and there, there are certain issues where Jefferson uh, was in conflict with uh, later positions in the South. But uh, he was, uh, in, in so many ways, uh, typical of his section. Um, you know, Virginia dominated the South. And uh, Calhoun at one point said, uh, if Virginia would just lead, we would be, do we would be fine. Uh, Virginia needs to take the lead again, because as when Virginia led, the Federal Republic was different. And if you look at early American history, it was. I mean, you had Jefferson, uh, you had Madison, you had Monroe, you had Washington, of course, a Virginian. You had Virginia leading in the political circles of the Union. And I think that's something that's often lost in our discussion of American history, how important the South was to that early fabric of the Federal Republic and what made that early Federal Republic great. Um, one of the great, uh, I think... Uh, problems of American history is viewing it through the lens of nationalism. 
And this is something I bring up in my forthcoming book, How Alexander Hamilton Screwed Up America. But the lie that states were the uh, problem in the Union has been accepted wholeheartedly by almost everyone in the United States. But what if that was wrong? What if the states, what if these states' rights, quote-unquote, people were actually trying to preserve the Union? And they were. What if their position was actually consistent with the Constitution and it was the nationalists who were the enemies? What if the nationalists were the reformers, the ones who were out there trying to destroy everything, and the Jeffersonians were interested in maintaining the true Union that was established by the first Constitution of the United States, the Articles of Confederation, and then the United States Constitution or the Constitution for the United States, which I think is the proper way to describe it. What if that was the case? That's not how we look at the government. That's not how we look at American history. But that is the truth of American history. It was the fact that the nationalists were the ones who were intent on destroying that Constitution as ratified the original Union. We've got it backwards. The nationalists were the disruptors, uh, not the states' rights individuals. They were not disrupting anything. Uh, so I think that if we started looking at American history in that light, in that regard, some things would be different in the way that we interpret our uh, historical documents, the way we interpret our past, and the way we look at our past in our political uh, tradition in the United States. So that said, and actually that can filter into cultural traditions and other things. I mean, look, Jefferson wasn't interested in telling New Englanders what to do. They were going to be New Englanders. But what he didn't want was New Englanders telling him what to do. And I think that's the, that's the essence of that early Federal Republic. And if we still had that spirit in America, Jefferson wasn't telling Roger Sherman of Connecticut how to, how to manage his backyard. And at, at the other hand, Roger Sherman wasn't telling Jefferson how to manage his backyard. Roger Sherman of Connecticut was a great man a great American, because he understood how important it was for the Union to be what it was, a decentralized federal republic. So if we can look at American history in that way, uh, then so many things would change in America. We wouldn't have these discussions that we have today where everything is a national issue. That's, that's ridiculous. Not everything is a national issue. And if you don't like where you live, in the state you live, you can vote with your feet. You can leave, and you can go to some other state. So if we had this, this original federal republic, this decentralized federal republic, well, then a lot of the problems we have today just wouldn't exist. And that is the Jeffersonian tradition. That said, uh, the, book, uh, the, the article on Tuesday was written by the late Jeffrey St. John. And the thing that, one of the things I like about this review was written in 1982 about uh, Clyde Wilson's uh, Why the South Will Survive, which um, was published uh, about 50 years after the uh, great I'll Take My Stand. And one of the things I like about this review, first of all, Jeffrey St. John was a giant in American conservatism for a time. Um, he was everywhere. He was on ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, he was on. Uh, he was doing radio. He was doing television. Uh, he had writ He had won Emmy awards. Uh, he had written a number of books. He was an an unabashed Southerner in that he loved the Southern tradition. Uh, he wrote for the Washington Times. He uh, produced for the Voice of America, and so did and so does actually the the article the last article of the week by Charles Goolsby. Um, he still works for the Voice of America, which. Uh, is uh, uh, the overseas arm of our uh, radio network. Uh, but Jeffrey St. John, again, was this huge figure, uh, nationally syndicated columnist, uh, and he's writing about the South. And that is so different from today. We have very few people who are, quote-unquote, mainstream voices who would be willing to write this type of article in 2017. And that's unfortunate because they're missing the boat. Uh, you know, Jeffrey, <laughs> Jeffrey St. John got it. And he says very, very at the beginning, you know, he's a naturalized Southern. He was born in the North, but educated in the South. And that has to do with our education system. Southern education is not what it used to be. Uh, but I love the first line of this review. As a naturalized Southerner, 
born in the North but educated in the South. It is a delight to discover this hard intellectual diamond among the soft dunghills of contemporary American publishing. That's wonderful. <laughs> because the same is, is true today. We have a lot of soft dunghills out there, and we have very few hard diamonds. Uh, and this book, Why the South Will Survive, still is a hard diamond. You can still get it. Um, you can still get uh, paperback versions. Uh, University of Georgia Press is still putting it out there. Uh, the hard, the uh, hardcover versions are harder to find, but you can still get them. Uh, and it's 15 essays, just like I'll Take My Stand, by different people. Uh, and the, the book is wonderful in that it outlines why the South is a relevant section even in 1981. Now, as you go back and you read the book and you realize this book now is over 30 years old, we were approaching 40 years old at this point. We're on, we're on the, the tail end of having it be 40 years old. You find that, and as I go back through these, this article was published in Southern Partisan in 1982. And as I go back through these Southern Partisan uh, magazine articles, you find that not a whole lot has changed. In fact, it's gotten a lot worse. Uh, but the other thing that I think is very sad about this particular book um, is that I think if you tried to write this book today, in 2017, you would have a hard time finding scholars to do it outside of, say, the Abbeville Institute. Uh, Clyde was drawing on a number of people in 1981 uh, that were not considered to be um, you know, conservative Southerners. They were just interested in the South. Some of them were on the left, uh, but they loved the South. And you would have a much harder time finding that today because we have been indoctrinated in the South to think the South is bad. If you're on the left in particular, you can't love the South. Uh, there's, there's nothing you can love about the South. What is there? It's just a bunch of backwards hillbillies. You can't love that. Uh, and so that's actually the piece on Wednesday, and Clyde gets into that a little bit. And that's because people are taught that. Even if you're on the left, it used to be if you're on the left, you still love the South. You understood what the South was, Southern culture. You love that part of it. Uh, you love the Southern people. Uh, you may not have liked certain elements of Southern history, but you love the South. Uh, and there were many people who had that position in the United States in the middle of the 20th century, even into the, into the late 20th century. But by the 21st century, they're gone. And that is one of the travesties of this effort, which has been largely successful to marginalize the South, to make it this peculiar other this insect, this specimen to be studied in Southern Studies uh, programs all across the South. What we really need are Northern Studies programs because that was the peculiar other, the North. And everyone knew that in the 19th century. Everyone knew it in the 20th century. The North was the peculiar other. It, were these, it was these Yankees who were peculiar, not Southerners. That was the mainstream. Everyone was a Southerner in so many ways because the South was America. The South is America. I mean, the way that people acted in the South was generally the dominant feature of the way Americans conducted themselves. It was Northerners, these meddling, nosy Northerners who were different. And so when you look at this book, Why the South Will Survive, this is a positive affirmation of what the South was and what the South is, and what the South could still offer to America. Uh, one thing that St. John brings up is a little book by uh, uh, Leon, David Leon Chandler. Uh, the title of the book was The Natural Superiority of Southern Politicians. No one really paid attention to it. But he says, this book was published in 1977, he says, Yet despite these undeniable facts, the South continues to be viewed by the rest of America with a mixture of condescension, undistinguished hatred and admiration for the region's raw bone, uh, raw bone approach to living. So uh, he points out in this book, Chandler points out that, look, all the great early American statesmen were Southerners. All the great things that were produced by America were produced by Southerners. You can't get around that. And how was it that that was the case? We actually had a, there's a wonderful piece on our website by Charles S. Sidnor uh, about why this was the case and how Virginia was able to lead. And that be was because, in his opinion, Virginia was undemocratic. Um, democracy was actually destroying this Southern tradition. And I think if you look at 
uh, you know, Francis Butler Simpkins points this out in The Enduring South. He points out how as democracy became more prevalent in the South, conditions got worse. Uh, that it was the undemocratic South that actually offered statesmanship, uh, it offered leadership, and people just followed because they understood, as Jefferson said, there's a natural aristocracy. Not everyone had to be the leader. There were natural leaders. We don't have those anymore because we don't have a climate where that's produced. We don't have natural leaders. We have politicians. We don't have statesmen. We have politicians, even in the South. Uh, so that South is gone. Uh, maybe it could be brought back. I don't know. We're trying our best here to, to get people to think about these things at the Abbeville Institute. What could we do that would be different and better? Um, but uh, that said, uh, this particular review is fantastic um, because it really shows how important this book was in 1982 and, in my mind, how important it still is for today. Uh, and as he says, as the book says, the American South endured defeat, poverty, military occupation, and decades of deliberate distortion and attack on its society of shared values on religion, family, and work. Both whites and blacks have shared these hardships. As a consequence, the South is better prepared to cope with the defeat in Vietnam and the Watergate trauma. Uh, Fred Hobson, associate professor of English at the University of Alabama, makes the salient point in his essay that while the nation seems to have been demoralized by Vietnam and Watergate, the South and Southwest, now called the Sun Belt, is booming. Its optimism, he observes, of the Sun Belt philosophy has confidence and confidence have been replaced or at least modified the southern legacy of failure, pessimism, and looking backward. For the first time since 1930, the South has dropped its defensive stance and speaks from a position of strength, even presumed superiority. Now, I wish that was the case today. It might have been the case in 1981, but it's not the case today, and that's what we're doing. That's why we're trying to say, look, that, say it loud and say it proud. You're Southern. Uh, it's not a fault. It's an opportunity. <laughs> my, my daughter said the other day, Daddy, why is it that everything good is in the South? <laughs> because it's true, right? Um, and uh, you look at all the things that are just so good about American society, you find that they all have Southern roots. Not to say the South is infallible, but so many good things are in the South. And we need, to, we need to talk about that. Um, and so um, one thing that uh, St. John says is he, he, he dissents from the despair. There is a little bit of despair in this book. Um, and he says, no, look, we don't need to despair. And, and I love his concluding paragraph. He says, the same must be said of those who made possible I'll take my stand in this new generation of, who have labored to produce why the South will, will survive. If, in the final analysis, all of us who wage the war of words to preserve those values that make us humane thinking and feeling individuals are just so, just so modern-day Ciceros, so what? We have discharged our duty to God, ourselves, our friends and family, and to our country. If others will not listen and learn, our God-granted intellectual and moral mission is done, and it is a problem not for us, but for them. So, if people don't listen, he's saying, so what? We're doing our job. This is our job to say these things. We're waging a war of words. It is a war. We're not fighting the old war. And that, that nicely bridges us to the piece that Clyde wrote in 2003, but published here, Southern Heritage Then and Now. He says, look, we have to stop fighting that war that took place from 61 to 65. That war is over. We lost that war. We can still fight this current war, which is preserving, preserving, Southern heritage. There used to be a truce, he talked about, after, after the war. You know, Northerners were pretty nasty in the 1860s and 70s. But that truce came in the 70s, late 70s and 80s, 1880s and 90s. The truce was, look, you Southerners say that you were right, uh, that we were right to win the war, that you were wrong to say we should leave, that you should have left the Union, that Abraham Lincoln was okay. You Southerners say that, and we'll say people like Lee and Jackson were great Americans, uh, that we respect and honor your, your heritage, your traditions, uh, and we'll all get along. And I think if you look at 
the Spanish-American War was the first time that that unit reunification really happened. Uh, and then that carried forward into the 20th century. Uh, you know, people like Franklin Roosevelt were, were happy to be seen in front of a Confederate battle flag. Uh, Winston Churchill had very nice things to say about the South. Uh, you know, John F. Kennedy was, uh, was seen in front of Confederate flags. They didn't care. But that truce, as Clyde says, is over. Uh, and he tells some stories from recent history in the, in the early 2000s. George W. Bush, while governor of a southern state, Texas, and running for president, sent his henchmen in the middle of the night to remove two harmless UDC plaques from a state office building. Governor Pataki of New York banned the true Georgia flag from the display at the state capitol. More recently, Vice President Cheney refused to come to the funeral of a longtime respected congressman if that congressman's wishes to have a Confederate flag and Dixie at his funeral were followed. The Secret Service was on hand to make sure the BP was not embarrassed by any display of evil symbols of the Confederacy. But, as he says... People in South Carolina gave him $300,000 to his campaign chest. I believe that uh, longtime respected congressman was Strom Thurmond. And he says, these are not left-wing multiculturalists. These are so-called conservative Republicans. These are people who could not have been elected without the votes of Confederate descendants. And he says, I could spend the rest of the month talking about this, how education in the South has been distorted, carpetbaggers, are saying that uh, America would be a better place if Southerners had been exterminated at the end of the war. Um, Southern honor was nothing but crude, violent suppression of dissent. Southern women did not really support the war on their menfolk. These are things that are being taught in universities across the South. Ninety historians in the, in the late 1990s were saying that the Confederate flag is about slavery and nothing else. And so that shows that the truth is over. As Clyde says, those times are gone, gone, gone. And he says, yet many of those who are charged with the defense of our heritage are living in a dream world, pretending that it's still 1950. The breaking of the truce has nothing to do with us. We did nothing to cause it. We kept our part of the bargain. It's happened because they have changed, and they are in a mode which requires them to scapegoat us, and not for the first time in history. He says, we have been for several years now fighting brush fires instead of realizing that we are in a war, a cold, cultural cold war with an enemy who wants us dead. Our Confederate heritage is being banished to a dark little forbidden corner of American life labeled slavery and treason. And incidentally, all the vast admirable contributions of Southerners to American history over four centuries are redefined as American and not really Southern. And this is why I say over and over again, the South is America. When you look at all the good things in America, they were in so many ways Southern. Jefferson's view of federalism, for example. So, uh, so Clyde says, you know, what should we do? Well, he says, first, I think we need to embrace and claim all of Southern history from Captain John Smith and Pocahontas right up to this moment. The four years of war, as important as that is, is only part of the long and continuing history of Southern people. And this is true. This is what we try to do at the Abbey Bill Institute and on this podcast. He says, but most of all, we need to reorient our thinking and fight this war rather than the last one. And I must say that many of those Southerners who have had the most power and influence have betrayed the Southern people and left the real fight to be carried on uh, by blue-collar Southern white males who have less public power than any group in the United States today. Now, you could say that 2016, in the Trump phenomenon, that group of blue-collar people really reasserted itself. But I think in some ways that's an aberration. He says, we need action from Southerners who have influence, who can make campaign contributions, who can call up governors and state legislators and newspaper editors and put on some real pressure, appealing to the people that have power and money. He says, in one of the greatest of all war films, the 1964 Zulu, there is a, just, there is a scene just before a few hundred British soldiers are attacked by thousands of war eager natives. An anxious young soldier asks, why us? The veteran, unflappable old sergeant major replies, because we're here, boy. That's why. And he says, we are here. If we're going to save our heritage as part of American life, it will have to be done by us. After us, it will be too late. That is a charge, I think. It's something that we need to think about at all times. We're here. Why us? Because we're here. This is what's happening, and we have to do it. 
On Thursday, we ran a piece entitled Manly Wade Wellman, the voice of the mountains. And most people don't know who Manly Wade Wellman was, but he was uh, an author and uh, wrote uh, fiction, science fiction. The thing about uh, Manly Wade Wellman and why I think this piece is, is quite interesting is because Wellman was so interested in the South, and yet he's a mainstream author. Um, and, again, we don't have that as much. Now, uh, there are some Southerners, some Southern authors, who still show some pride in Southern culture uh, and um, what it means to be Southern, uh, but there are far fewer than there used to be. And Manly Wade Wellman um, uh, was named after General Wade Hampton. Um, and so Southern Mountain culture to Manly Wade Wellman inspired him throughout his long career. Um, as Tuggle says at the end of the piece, folklorist, popular historian, recontour, and a lover of fine tobacco and an occasional good lick of blockade whiskey. Manly Wade Wellman personified the Southland he knew and loved so well. And he loved Waylon Jennings' version of Rebel Soldier. Um, and so he wrote a number of books about the South and uh, about Southern history, in addition to his works on science fiction and other things. I mean, this is just... Uh, this is this is interesting because you, you don't find this as much anymore. Uh, it's few and far between that you have Southerners as interested in this. So it's important to know who these Southerners are that were so proud of the South and read their work. And finally, on Friday, we had a piece by Charles Goolsby on Bernard Baruch, son of the South. And Bernard Baruch was one of the most important statesmen, di diplomats, really, in American history uh, in the 20th century. And he was a, a Jew. Uh, his his uh, family were, were Jews and uh, living in, in South Carolina. Uh, and so uh, that's often unknown. But Bernard Baruch uh, was influential in the Roosevelt administration. Uh, he's influential in the Wilson administration. Uh, and so this guy... Uh, was so important for uh, the future of American diplomacy. But the thing I like most about Baruch's story is that his Southern upbringing really determined what he was going to be like as a diplomat. And uh, Goolsby brings that up at the end. He says, publicly attacked by such notorious anti-Semites as Gerald L. K. Smith, Dudley Peely, and German dictator Adolf Hitler, Baruch clung throughout his life to the tolerance, goodwill, and mutual respect he had experienced as a boy in the South. Quote, I have told my children not to be blinded to the greatness of America by the pettiness of some of the people in it, wrote Baruch. It was that respect in the South. You don't hear that. How tolerant Southerners were of Jews. And, and uh, the, the, oftentimes, when, when people say that the Confederate battle flag is just like the Nazi swastika, they have no idea and the tolerance that Jews received in the South. None. Uh, and in other parts of the South as well for other things. Uh, and one of these days I'll, I'll uh, do a review of a, of a little book I've been reading uh, on the Mississippi River. And um, it, it gets into this quite a lot. Uh, and Baruch said, quote, The priceless heritage which America has given us, the heritage which is America, is the opportunity of being able to better oneself through one's own striving. No form of government can give a person more than that. And as long as that heritage remains ours, we will continue our progress towards better religious and racial understanding as more and more of each of us comes to be recognized for his or her own worth. That's Southerners speaking. And he was so influenced by the South, that's a Southerner speaking. So I think when you look at uh, you know, Baruch's life and, and uh, this, this particular story, we need to understand that. Uh, this was this was so important. Being Southern was important to the fabric of who he was. And we lose that uh, as we try to demonize and disparage the South, which is what we were being relegated to this other corner. Southern as you embrace Barad Baruch and Manly Wade Wellman and Clyde Wilson and Thomas Jefferson and Jeffrey St. John and all of the people in the South that made the South what it was. We need to embrace 400 years of history 
We need to be proud and say that we're Southern. I think that's what our summer school is going to do. So if you like that idea, you should think about going to the summer school. And if you like that idea, do it on your daily life. You know, Explain, well, all the good things are in the South. Until next time, good day. Thank you.